It's getting pretty crowded in the energy storage sector these days, don't you think? It seems like almost every other day an article or peer-reviewed paper drops into my news feed about a breakthrough game changer that's apparently set to revolutionise the industry. Believe it or not, I do try to filter out the inventions that are, you know, slightly more ambitious and only bring you the ones that are either already on the market or that are sufficiently far along the R&D and funding road that they do at least look like they have a decent chance of finding their way into a production facility at some point in the near future. And as several of you have suggested in recent months, I will try to revisit some of those innovations in upcoming videos to see how they're actually performing in the real world. One of the more promising technologies we've looked at on the channel is flow batteries. They're cheap, safe, reliable and scalable and they will no doubt be an important addition to stationary utility scale energy storage in certain applications. But they're also quite big and cumbersome and have all sorts of intricate mechanical components that require highly specialised maintenance. Plus they need auxiliary power to get them going in the first place, which is a drain on their overall efficiency, requiring a secondary backup system for the battery itself. So what if we could keep all the advantages of flow batteries and get rid of the disadvantages? Well, yes, you've guessed it, someone has found a way. And I'm not talking about a group of laboratory researchers here. This one's a publicly listed company with multi-million dollar funding and a global partner for mass production. So is it time to break out the overused superlative cliches once again? Well, let's take a look and find out. Hello, and welcome to Just Have a Think. We've talked about flow batteries a couple of times on the channel. They are unapologetically robust and industrial in nature. You basically fill two containers with an electrolyte solution, which can be something like vanadium, or in this example, zinc bromide. The electrolytes are pumped into a central stack where the zinc gets deposited on one electrode and the bromide converts to bromine on the other electrode. That process consumes electrons and stores energy. To discharge the system, you pump the depleted electrolyte back through the stack to reverse the process and liberate the electrons to flow out into a circuit. If you want more energy, you just add bigger tanks. Unlike normal batteries, you can discharge these things right down to zero without causing any damage, and they'll keep charging and discharging for thousands of cycles with almost negligible loss of capacity. So there's a lot to like, whether you're a domestic user or a remote microgrid community or a full-scale utility grid operator. The downside is the complexity of pumps, pipes, valves and manifolds required to move the liquids around the system, all of which, as I mentioned earlier, need power to run. And unlike lead acid or lithium ion batteries, when the battery is fully discharged, that power has to come from an external source to get the process started, a bit like the cranking handle on an old Model T Ford. All of that represents a drag on the overall efficiency of the system. So who's this publicly listed business that claims to have ironed out all the wrinkles then? Well, they're called Gelion, which is a name derived, unsurprisingly, from the words gel and ion, which kind of gives you a clue about the technology they've developed. The company was founded by a chemist called Professor Thomas Mashmeyer from the University of Sydney in Australia and it's now listed on the AIM market in the London Stock Exchange. I caught up with Professor Mashmeyer via a Zoom call recently, and he explained how his innovation works. In contrast to existing flow batteries, the zinc bromide gel battery looks very familiar indeed. In fact, the housing is pretty much exactly the same as a lead acid battery, which is something we'll touch on later. If you open the casing up, you find sets of negative and positive electrodes with membranes to separate them and prevent short circuits, just like a standard battery. The electrolyte is largely present as a gel rather than a liquid, hence the gel part of the gel ion name. It's a water-based material containing various additives and salts, including zinc bromide. Just like the flow battery, during charging, zinc ions migrate to the negative electrode, where they accept electrons and get reduced to zinc metal. The bromide ions flow across to the positive electrode where they lose electrons to become bromine. And then when the battery is discharged, the process is reversed, allowing electrons to flow out into a circuit and provide electrical power. Having the gel electrolyte inside the battery with the electrodes eliminates the need for a pumping system. And that means the Gelion battery can start charging from zero without the need for an external power source to run any pumps. 
Professor Mashmeyer also pointed out that using a gel rather than a liquid keeps the bromine really well distributed inside the battery, which greatly reduces unwanted processes like dendrite formation, bromine stratification, hydrogen formation and pH drift. Lead acid batteries are better than lithium ion batteries at coping with high operating temperatures, but once you get above about 40 degrees Celsius, both battery types generally require cooling systems to prevent battery degradation or even the risk of fire. The July on battery can operate right up to 50 degrees Celsius without the need for cooling, which is handy, especially in certain standalone working environments that might not be as well regulated or managed as a utility scale grid system. Those standalone facilities might experience overcharging or over discharging, which can cause big problems for existing battery technology. The July on battery can be discharged to zero volts and left in storage for long periods with no adverse risks or consequences and no impact on performance or longevity. And it's much more tolerant of overcharging too, not least because for reasons of physics that are outside the scope of this video, the homogeneous distribution of the bromine and bromide within the gel electrolyte acts as a fire retardant. Lead acid batteries have of course been around for a very long time now and competition from lithium ion and other energy storage technologies mean they're on something of a long-term downward trajectory. But they're still pretty ubiquitous all over the world and the industry is still worth about $45 billion a year. The gel ion battery has been specifically designed and configured to fit snugly into the production cycle of lead acid battery factories. Offering a new technology to all those very well established manufacturing facilities is a very smart move. There are something like 22 steps to make a gel ion battery and 18 of them are taken directly from lead acid battery manufacturing, leaving only four unique steps to incorporate. They can even package their product in these same casings as lead acid batteries. That's a huge advantage in terms of market entry that's not available to technologies like redox flow batteries, which require new production lines and facilities to be built and financed from scratch. Professor Mashmeyer put some numbers to that assertion. He told me that to retrofit an existing one gigawatt lead acid battery facility to start making one gigawatt of zinc bromide gel batteries would cost around 16 million US dollars. By comparison, to set up a lithium ion battery facility from scratch with the same production capacity costs about 130 million US dollars. And the July advantages flow right through to the recycling stages as well, which is a crucial consideration as we move towards the circular economy of the future. Lead acid batteries are already very widely recycled at fairly low cost, but they do contain lots of nasty stuff like toxic lead and corrosive sulfuric acid, which are hazardous to the environment if they leak out. Lithium ion battery recycling is only in the early stages of development and it's a very complex process to separate out all the materials. It will get much better over time, of course, no doubt, but right now it's just not economically viable without significant subsidy. The July ion battery can be recycled in existing lead acid battery recycling facilities and at a similar low cost, but with far fewer environmental risks because the discharge cells don't contain any toxic metals or strong acids. Now, a zinc bromide gel battery is never going to be as light as a lithium ion battery just by nature of the different materials and chemistry types used. Gelion is currently aiming for specific energy densities around 50 to 60 watt hours per kilogram, which is significantly lower than the 200 or so that can be achieved with lithium ion. So it's probably fair to say they're not about to completely eliminate the competition, but there's no doubt there will be many applications where Gelion's advantages will make them a more attractive option. Remote off-grid areas in developing nations are a perfect example. And Gelion are already working on a 100 megawatt hour project in Papua New Guinea, to bring energy independence and new income streams to local people there. But the chemistry of the July on battery means it can work just as well as a replacement for gas peaker plants to provide peak time stability on utility scale grid systems. And with a discharge time sweet spot of between four and eight hours, it's a great solution for shifting renewable energy from the time it's generated to the time it's needed, helping to move solar and wind closer to that magic goal of baseload generation. The batteries themselves will be formatted to run at 12 or 48 volts and of course they can be combined together in series and parallel to achieve whatever voltage and current is required. July and are currently building a pilot production line in partnership with a Sydney based manufacturer called Battery Energy. And they've got a second partnership with a very large global scale battery producer in India to get mass production up and running there. As well as all that, 
Earlier this year, Jalion was selected by one of Europe's largest sustainable energy companies, Aziona Energy, to supply working models so that Aziona can assess how to integrate them into their existing production capacity. So there we are then folks, another brave innovator entering the increasingly crowded energy storage market. As always, only time will tell how successful this particular technology proves to be, but the combination of low cost, abundant materials, a well-established manufacturing base, and a very robust, safe and reliable architecture means there's a good chance Jalion could carve out a lucrative niche in our sustainable energy future. No doubt you've got your own views on these sorts of technologies. So as always, feel free to jump down to the comment section below to leave your thoughts there. That's it for this week though. I'm taking a short break now, so there'll be no video next week, but I'll be back on Sunday the 19th of June with more news and views from the world of climate change and sustainable technology. In the meantime, a huge thank you to our amazing Patreon supporters who help me maintain the channel's independence and keep advertising out of these videos. And that's something you can get involved with too if you feel like you could support my work here for the price of a coffee each month and keep me posting videos every Sunday. And you can find out all about how to do that by following the link in the description to patreon.com forward slash just have a think. And of course, you can always show your support completely for free by clicking the subscribe button and hitting the notification bell so you don't miss a video. It's just a simple click, which you can do down there or on that icon there. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next time.